Good evening, I'm really delighted to welcome Chris Ewers, who is a lecturer in 18th century literature at the University of Exeter. His work focuses upon mobility in literature of the long 18th century, and his first book, Mobility and the Novel from Defoe to Austin, traces the development of the novel in response to transport development in the 18th century. And today, Chris is going to talk to us about mobility and the sentence. So thanks so much, Chris, and over to you. Um, okay, um, I'm just going to try and share my screen just to check that this uh, works. Um, can I just check that people, you can all, can everybody see the um, PowerPoint? That's fantastic. Okay, because um, I'm going to kind of speak to this as it goes along. So I hope that things work um, in terms of connections. Um, I'd like to just, just to start with, I'd like to thank David very much for um, inviting me and for Charlotte for chairing. Um, I'm kind of very conscious and a little worried that I'm about to talk about literature to a, um, a history and mobility and transport seminar. Um, so I hope that you will kind of bear with me if I verge into too literary a direction. Um, you'd like to think that one of the advantages of being a literature, a literature student is that I would get my spelling right. But as you can see in the um, sub deck of this front slide, I can't even spell transport correctly. So that's kind of a slightly worrying start. Um, but what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to hopefully think about the way literature fits in with transport and mobility studies. So hopefully it will kind of have a relevance um, to all of these disciplines, um, even if this is just from a, a slightly oblique angle. Um, for a while, I've been considering um, the question of exactly what a literary approach contributes to mobility studies and transport history. Um, and I'm really hoping that nobody is silently thinking anything in the negative as I ask that question. Um, and really what I'm trying to consider is not so much what, what literary scholars have done, because I think that there's kind of now kind of a long uh, body of brilliant work on literary geographies. Um, but what is it about literature that provides a distinct contribution that brings something different to transport history and mobility studies. Um, and one thing to say at the outset is I'm not looking or trying to create any kind of a hierarchy. I think one of the real strong points of mobility studies is its interdisciplinarity. It's one of the things I really love about the topic, the way it merges um, ideas of technology, ideas of history, ideas of geography, and for me, ideas of literature together. Um, but one of the things that has bothered me for quite a long time now is that in any meaningful sense I kind of do not do history, I don't really do um, geography, I don't really do sociology in kind of the proper disciplinary sense of those ideas um, and what I kind of do probably and this is the nice word for it, uh, magpie, other people's research in a way bring it together and then use it to try to rethink literary uh, mobilities. Um, and for instance, I mean, Charlotte very kindly mentioned my first book, Mobility um, and the English Novel. But this book itself was really deeply indebted to the work of economic historians and economic geographers. Um, in particular, I was kind of fascinated by Eric Pawson's 1977 book on transport and economy. Um, where he talks about the Turnpike Road Network and how this transforms Britain in the 18th century. Um, and I became sort of sadly fascinated by some of the maps that um, Eric Pawson included in his book. Um, for instance, this was a map of the Turnpike Network in 1719 when uh, Robinson Crusoe was published. Uh, and one of the things that had always puzzled me about Robinson Crusoe was why he takes a boat from Hull to London. Well, this kind of map of the turnpike network seemed to me to make this clear. And it also suggested his sort of blindness to the kind of interior world of um, England. Um, and then again, one of the other maps that Eric Pawson includes is the kind of turnpike development by 1749. And again, this is the moment of Tom Jones. And it seems to me that this map really spoke to me about the way that Tom Jones spends almost a third of his novel kind of caught in the hills and byways of Somerset and South Gloucestershire. 
and then very, very quickly speeds towards London. And this kind of map helped explain kind of the geography of the novel, which had always puzzled me. Um, and then again, this is kind of the Turnpike Network in 1770. You can see this kind of amazing explosion of networkings of roads, the kind of what's sometimes been described as the Turnpike boom, um, and this revolution in internal transport in Britain. And again, you could read into this so many of the novels around the 1760s and 1770s, the way they start talking about letters, connections, other places, the way that the whole landscape of the novel alters um, in response in a way to this idea of mobility. Um, and one of the things I talked about in the book is to make a kind of a wider point about the emergence of the novel in Britain in this period, that to some extent, the novel really emerges as a form um, in the long 18th century, certainly in Britain. And the novel itself is a form that really speaks to mobility, the kind of the long duration that a novel um, undergoes, its fascination with journeys, um, you know, all of these kind of elements. It's, it's almost as if, if you needed a form to describe a society on the move, then the novel would be that form. So this is kind of the way that other people's research hopefully helped me to kind of think or add something in terms of ideas of literary research. But again, my question was really, how does these ideas then speak back to transport history or mobility studies? Um, and to give another example, this is one of the things I found fascinating. This was the, what I kind of believe to be the first um, element of um, the mimesis of speed being introduced into British literature. Um, this is from Tristram Shandy in um, effectively 1759, 1760, 1761. Um, and this is a moment when Tristram Shandy's coach travels um, to Paris. Um, and as you can guess by the whip cracks sort of at the top, his coach is traveling at high speed. Um, I don't, I'm not gonna read the whole uh, passage out because I think you can see it there in front of you. Um, but what I found interesting was this kind of introduction of speed, but also this introduction of speed writing, the way in which the form of the writing mimics the um, experience of speed. Um, as you can see that Tristram travels so quickly that he cannot finish a thought, let alone to even finish a sentence. Um, but again, while this kind of arrival of speed helps say something about the development of mimesis in literary technique or a new patterning of narrative in terms of slowing and speeding up the narrative, the kind of prehistory of speed was already well documented by critics such as Jeffrey T. Schnapp um, amongst others. Kind of, so the my kind of question was, is my way of doing literary mobility just an addition to their research? Or is there something about literary um, abilities or looking at transport history from a literary point of view? Does this generate anything different? Um, so this is kind of my research question or the question of this paper. Um, but of course, I'm not the first person to even remotely come to approach this. Um, a number of critics have considered the problem. Um, for instance, Andrew Thacker in his book on modernism, moving through modernity, um, but also probably the first concerted attempt to theorize the connection between literature and mobility. Um, and this is a plug for Charlotte. So I hope that the sales increase enormously of your book in the next uh, 10 or 15 minutes. Um, but again, it's the introduction to mobility's literature and culture edited by uh, Marian Aguirre, Charlotte and Lynn Pierce. Um, I'm not gonna rehearse their really cogent arguments, um, but I would say that I am again bouncing off them um, and stealing from them in equal measure. Um, something I seem to always be doing in my research. Um, but also, and I think this, I should say this as a fair point that in comparison to sort of their sanity, my suggestions that I'm gonna make are possibly going to seem slightly mad. Um, this might be something to do with lockdown. I, it might be to do with my own brain, but the kind of things that I'm gonna discuss are perhaps pushing things maybe beyond where they should be pushed. So I hope that you bear with this. Um, 
and again, what I'd want to do, rather than making any comprehensive claim, because this is a subject too large to be comprehensive about, I just wanted to think about four ways um, in which the space of the sentence or the space of the artwork or the film or the line of poetry helps place a different lens on our ideas of mobility and transport. Um, and so this is what I take to be possibly four different ways that texts help reframe transport. The first is that literature foregrounds the idea of transport as genre. The second is that a book or a film or a painting always transforms mobility's spatio-temporal patterns. Um, the third is that the sentence always reframes the grammar of journeys. And finally, that artistic representations do not just highlight the embodied nature of mobility, but they always enmesh this with a wider socio-historical or cultural narrative. Um, and so with extraordinary originality, I'm gonna go through these points uh, one by one. Um, and I'm gonna start with the first one, which I hope is probably the simplest and clearest. Um, as well as 18th century and romanticism, I also teach a sport and literature module at Exeter. Um, and one of the key things in this module is to think about the way a sport doesn't just sort of stand alone, that the way in which one thinks of baseball is deeply bound up with the way that you think of American football, or the way that you think about wrestling is deeply bound up with the way that you think about um, boxing that to some extent all sports all sports create their own genre. Um, I think that this is similar as well in terms of ideas of transport. Um, here in this image on the slide, um, I've got the strange sight of a coach um, being carried by a train. So you have this kind of, um, you know, these kind of unusual moments when there's a degree of hybridity in terms of transport. Also there's this slide again of um, kind of, a truck and an aeroplane and a ship being placed together and coming into alignment. Um, now I know that there are many kind of historians and cultural commentators who've spoken really interestingly about this kind of hybrid nature of transport. Um, Wolfgang Schivelbusch, for instance, speaks really interestingly about the debt of the train to the earlier coach journey. Um, I think also that, I think it'd be fair to say that these are, tend to be odd moments that most histories and cultural analysis tend to laser in on their main subject, on their main form of transport. Um, one of the things I think is different about literature is that literature is never ever about just one form of transport, that it always places two forms of mobility alongside each other um, and usually multiple forms. Um, to give two, two kind of ideas, examples of kind of books that have tried to address this situation. Um, Ian Carter, in his Railways and Culture in Britain, he keeps asking where, in the age of the steam train, you can find the great train novel. Um, and he lands, I think, rather unconvincingly on Arnold Bennett's accident. Um, and again, Ender Duffy, in his book, The Speed Handbook, again, a really brilliant synoptic survey of automobility and speed. Um, he again tries to find the great automobile text. Um, he plumps for Wyndham Lewis's The Revenge for Love. Um, both of these great critics and I think great books, but they also seem to, I think, miss the point that what literature and art does is place mobility not as a singular ex experience, but as part of multiple trajectories. When we read about a train journey or a coach ride in a novel, the description is not purely um, a form of mirroring. Say for instance, as we get in that Tristram Shandy passage, a kinesthetic attempt to mimic the experience of speed. It's also a placing of speed within a genre of slowness or placing speed next to another form of mobility. Um, you know, the Tristram works by its comparison rather than by it being the thing itself. Um, to give another example, and this is a, a rather extreme version of placing mobilities side by side. Um, this is William Heath's um, The March of Intellect from 1829. Um, and you can see this is a very 
I mean, I'm sure you're all very familiar with this image, but you can see this is a very manic idea of what happens when frictionless travel um, may start to adjust or change uh, the nature of Britain. Um, now, although I've never been propelled down a vacuum tube to Bengal, and I've never been transported to Australia um, by Vampire Bat, although I have traveled on Ryanair, um, I can imagine that the different experiences of travel that are placed side by side here, how they would alter your cognition and alter the way that you um, feel and experience. Um, again, these representations of mobility continually focus on these points of difference. Um, for instance, in Heath's image, I mean, I don't know how well you can see this slide, but just before we have the grand vacuum tube, we have um, a couple strolling towards it, a lady with a parasol. Um, I find it's interesting that walking is introduced into this kind of world of mad mobility, that somehow it's walking again forms a kind of um, a different form of mobility by which all of these other mobilities can be measured against. Um, and also again, that mobility, I'm sorry, that walking is kind of placed as a before. You know, you can guess that after the lady with her parasol has gone through the vacuum tube, uh, the parasol will be looking something rather different. Um, and to some extent, I also wonder if, and this is kind of possibly a mad idea, but I wonder if that for most of us, walking is a type of baseline genre that all mobility is measured against. Um, the reason I think of this is that in Robert McFarlane's book, um, The Wild Places, he cites a quote from Soren Kierkegaard, uh, which I've never been able to um, track down, probably due to the fact that my Danish is probably not very good. Um, but Kierkegaard argues that humans are hotwired to move at three miles an hour, um, that there is a type of normative human mobility um, and that anything else alters uh, disrupts our cognitive um, processes. Um, now, I'm not sure that if this is completely true. Um, my uh, probably uh, default form of mobility involves sort of sitting on a corner sofa. But if you take Kierkegaard's suggestion seriously, every form of transport is a variation, a creation of a new type of genre, which profoundly alters experience. Um, and again, I think that books, films, and paintings foreground this by placing these modes in close proximity. And they also, and this leads me to my second point, they always reframe mobility's spatio-temporal patterns. Um, um, and as we all know, a key insight of mobility studies is, um, and also of transport history, is the idea that each form of transport or each mode of transport has its own spatio-temporal kind of um, specifics, that to undergo transport is to be taken from one type of realm to another um, in these kind of terms of time and space. Um, and so, for instance, this is the opening of Virginia Woolf's first published novel, The Voyage Out, which again seems to use walking as a baseline idea of mobility. Um, and this describes the Ambrose's journey towards the London docks as they're about to embark on ship. So you have the bit on the land where you have, as the streets that lead from the strand to the embankment are very narrow, it is better not to walk the, down them arm in arm. So you get this sense of this rather closed in, the narrow sort of side streets leading to the Thames um, through this kind of often uh, legal enclave behind the temple. Um, and then we get the bit when they've moved to the docks, um, they embark on ship and the description, suddenly the party on board were free of roads, free of mankind and the same exhilaration at their freedom ran through them all. Um, it's not just two modes of transport that are contrasted, but two types of space time that are also placed together. Um, now this study of ideas of space and time has a really venerable um, tradition in terms of literary studies. Um, it was probably first um, proposed by Mikhail Bakhtin in 1937 in his essay about forms of time and the chronotope. Um, and he uses the term chronotope, um, you know, quite literally chronos, time, uh, tope, topos and space to suggest that in effect, all spaces have their own time characteristics. 
And of course, this is deeply bound up with ideas of mobility. Um, again, that each form of movement creates its own form of space-time experience. Um, what I'd like to argue is that somehow literary and artistic representations also add an extra layer to this because they always reframe this idea of the chronotope. Um, and this, I think, is because the reading process or the looking process is also involved in reordering time. Um, Christina Lupton, in a, her brilliant recent book, Reading Time, um, has suggested that perhaps the most profound contribution of literature is the way it reshapes our conception of temporality. To some extent, we don't read books for information. I mean, if I wanted to find out about speed, I could um, look up on Wikipedia and find lots of details, or I could some, read some journal articles. I don't really need to plow through 800 pages of Tristram Shandy. Um, so what we're kind of doing when we read books, perhaps, is looking to inhabit a different type of form of duration. Um, that somehow books create a different time experience for us. Um, and this is partly in the way that we read a book, that when you read a book, you kind of read forwards and backwards at the same time. But it's also partly because of our own position that when we read a book, we're also in a way released from our own normative temporal frames. Um, and just to give a kind of an example of this, um, rather than kind of ask you to go away, read 800 pages of Tristram Shandy and come back. I thought what I would do is just sort of try to illustrate this by looking at uh, a couple of images from Humphrey Repton's Fragments on the Theory of Landscape Gardening, um, entitled Improvements. And this is kind of an image of uh, transport infrastructure. Um, and again, it's kind of an interesting story behind this in that the bottom image is one of Repton's favorite ever stretches of British landscape, which when he kind of returns to, to walk it again, sort of 15 or 20 years later, he discovers that a parvenu landlord has kind of taken over possession of the local estate and has completely transformed the way that the nature, the, na the kind of the idea of the nature, uh, this idea of enclosure. Um, there's lots that you can say about these images. You know, you have the, the fast growing fir trees, the commodification of the landscape and the improvement compared to the more natural and relaxed leisure times sense of the landscape below it. There's also the kind of extraordinary sense that this new form of road um, and this new form of patterning of the landscape creates an injunction to move on. You can see in the top image, everybody is moving quite quickly. Um, whereas at the bottom, people are just sitting on chairs and talking. Um, there's also the sense that the linearity of the landscape is being pushed and extended by these changes. Um, again, I don't know how well you can see the slides, but at the top of the horizon in the improvements or the improved landscape, uh, there's a gentleman on a horse kind of looking sideways. Um, and this always makes me think of William Cobbett in Rural Rides, where he desperately wants to travel cross country to places. But each time he's being told, no, you can't go this way. You have to go by the turnpike roads. Um, so I think this is a really rich image, but what I find particularly interesting about it is that the way the eye moves in each of these images. In the old image, much like enclosure kind of allows you to wander through the different places, your eyes are able to wander. There's no clear point of focus in all of this image. You can move from one spot to another, you can um, roam around. Whereas the top image, you're very much taken by the fences, and by the walls and by the way the sweep of the road curves towards the vanishing point, you're very much taken to the horizon. Um, and again, I think this vanishing point functions in a double way, that not only are you kind of being, from an artistic point of view, taken towards the vanishing point, but also in this image, the landscape as well is beginning to vanish in this new idea of transport. But my point is that from us viewing this here, in the bottom image, we can have that experience of the eye wandering. In the top image, you have the image of the eye being trained as you kind of are forced to look towards the horizon. And yet from where you are as watching these images as a kind of a viewer of an artistic representation, 
not only are they side by side, but you can kind of move between them, between one and another. Um, in some ways, you can almost try and take them in both at the same time, that you have these representations of mobility, but you can look at them from a position of stasis, that you can kind of move through them, but you can also move away from them. Um, so this is kind of what I think is kind of happening in terms of literature as well, um, that to some extent, you're kind of placed, I think this is, I did, earlier on I had this picture of Bunbury and um, Richmond Hill. I really like the stationary um, pedestrian looking on at this form of mobility. I think he almost sort of stands in for you yourself as the viewer of the painting, looking in at the kind of all this kind of frenetic activity. And there's this sense of being sort of slightly outside of the mobility while also being inside of it that I think is key. Um, you know, in many ways, you're almost in a neutral time and space. Your eye and cognition moves, but your body is taken out of time. You're given sort of space to judge and consider. It's almost as if you've been set free from mobility while at the same time being able to experience it and analyze it. Um, and again, I think perhaps the main chronotope of reading, and here I mean reading in the widest sense, is perhaps that it sets us free from other chronotopes and allows us a new vantage point in which to view mobility. Um, and this leads to the third suggestion, um, which is um, that the idea that the sentence alters or rewrites the grammar of journeys. Um, some of the earliest work on literary descriptions of transport have come from, came from historians, geographers, um, who all insisted that imaginative literature, that passages from writing in the past and artistic images had a validity as sources for while one was studying transport history or transport geography, despite their fictive nature. Um, the argument was that the imaginative representations provided an access to the real, which was no different from other, you know, inverted commas, factual sources. Um, and, you know, I agree with this. One of my favorite uh, quotes um, or comments from Flaubert is that when he was writing Madame Bovary, he said that there were a thousand Bovaries up and down France in village after village. And he then goes on to say that literature is a subject as precise as geometry. Um, but of course, I think there's more to that, more to it than that. And I think theorists such as Michel de Cert and also uh, Michel Boutour have insisted that each journey has its own grammar. Um, you know, that Dessert argues that the act of walking is to the urban system, what the speech act is to language. Um, and he goes on to add that stories traverse and organize places. They select and link them together. They make sentences and itineraries out of them. They are spatial trajectories. Every story is a travel story, a spatial practice. So there's a clearly kind of inherent link between mobility and the sentence. Um, and again, I think it has something to do with grammar, uh, ideas of prepositions and um, angles of approach perhaps. Um, and just to give an example of this, um, I'm thinking of a, balo a balloon journey, which has kind of in a way a quite a clear grammar in each time, each form of balloon ascent. Um, it will always be patterned by the takeoff, the kind of the moment of floating and then the landing. Um, and of course, all of these parts have a relationship with each other. Um, the proximity to the ground will create a certain type of narrative. The gradual ascent with the widening of the horizon will also help to shape and determine another form of narrative or another way of um, seeing the journey. Um, the serene journey through the air will um, probably um, contrast the kind of hefty thump or thud as the balloon comes to the ground. Um, what I find interesting about this idea of grammar and writing is that somehow in literature, I think, something always extra is added when you translate the material reality of a journey into the fictive reality of a sentence. Um, and I want to just take for an example, Dickens' really celebrated description of train travel in Dombey and Son. Um, yeah, I'm 
going to I'll read it out so I'm afraid you'll have to suffer my terrible way of reading through Dickens which is quite shocking um, but I'll try to give this in a, a decent way um, so you have through the hollow on the height by the heath by the orchard by the park by the garden over the canal across the river where the sheep are feeding where the mill is going where the barge is floating um, it carries on and on and then we go and the wild breeze smooths or ruffles it at its inconsistent will, away with a shriek and a roar and a rattle, and no trace to leave behind but dust and vapour, like as in the track of the remorseless monster, death. Um, I think like Auden's Nightmare, this is a fantastic rendering of the rhythm of train travel. Um, and also, in a way, as a historic or historical source, it's really interesting for considering the shock of the railway. It's also really interesting to think about what the railway does in terms of place. Um, you have, for instance, this kind of um, generic sense of place. We have you know, the Heath, but we don't have Hampstead Heath. We have the park, but we don't have Regent's Park. There's this sense that the train journey, as uh, Chivalbush argues, starts to delocate our ideas of um, place and turns them into ideas of space. Um, but what I also find really interesting about this description is the way that the grammar does something remarkable. If you look at the beginning, um, this kind of twinned set of um, kind of a preposition, a definite article, and then a kind of this generic place on the height, by the heath, by the orchard, by the park. What you get is you get a kind of sense of being inside the train. Um, there's something almost prepositional about your position um, as you feel the train moving forward. But by, but by the end, again, something very odd happens in that you then get moved to be outside the train that away the train goes with a sh shriek and a roar and a rattle, that you're then turned like the Bunbury um, spectator. You're then kind of placed outside of the train at the same time, that you're left in the wake of the kind of the dust and the vapor. Um, and again, I think what this representation does is creates a type of doubleness, a sense of being um, both within the mode of transport but also a real awareness of its mediation, of seeing it from outside, that it's being translated, as you like, if you like, into something else. Um, you know, this is something I think that Jane Austen does uh, constantly. You know, her use of free indirect discourse, where she sort of, the sentence tends to move from an objective outward frame, then it goes into the mind of her characters, and then often telescopes outwards. Um, like the Dickens train depiction, or even those two Repton landscapes, continually as a reader or a viewer, you're being placed kind of inside and outside at the same time. And I think this is one of the things that the grammar of literature and the grammar of um, paintings and art and sometimes film kind of continually do. Um, to give a kind of slightly more less well-known um, uh, example, depending on how well you know early 18th century poetry, although this is quite a famous poem, this is uh, Swift's description of a city shower. Um, and this is Swift speaking just as the rain comes down into the streets of London. Um, so you have brisk Susan whips her linen from the rope while the first drizzling shower is born aslope. Such is that sprinkling which some careless queen flirts on you from her mop, but not so clean. You fly, invoke the gods, then turning stop to rail. She singing, still whirls on her mop. Um, I think it would be fair to say that the image that I've included there, Edward Penny's um, A City Shower, is probably not one of the great triumphs of realist art, um, but it does give a sense of the degree of shock for the pedestrian as their progress is arrested by the kind of the city maid doing her daily work and her sort of the daily chores. Um, what I also think is interesting is that the rhythm of the poem brilliantly evokes this kind of idea of movement. Um, the poem is written in heroic couplets so that each sort of two lines sort of rhyme together in twinned lines. What Swift does is that he uses this to give you a sense of the change of rhythm when the walker tries to avoid the mop. In those last two lines, there are five breaks in terms of commas or semicolons. 
the forward motion of the verse is arrested and the rather tricksy run on line that follows the word stop. You know, you read the word stop and you think that's the end of the phrase. But then when you come on to the next line, you're kind of tripped up as you realize it's stop to rail rather than just stop. That the kind of verse arrests you just as um, the actual motion or action in the poem does. Um, but apart from just mimicking his mobility, the verse also does something different, other, something else as well, I think. It also contrasts two city street rhythms. We get the easy rhyming at the start and this jarring sentence structure at the end. Also, we also get this kind of his angry to rail and her to singing placed alongside each other by the almost deliberately convoluted sentence structure and word order. We also get his linear motion being arrested while she twirls on her mop in a circular motion that suggests a really different rhythm, a type of contrast perhaps between the domestic worker and the city walker. Um, so again, I think that one of the things that artistic representations do is that this idea of grammar continually um, places different forms of mobility against each other and again places you at a distance from them. So you get a sense of two senses of mobility, multiple ideas of rhythm. Um, one of the things I'd also just, this is probably a, a slight side departure, but one of the things I would also find interesting is this idea of um, that one of the kind of key skills of literary studies is the fact that it uses close reading to try to understand mobility. Um, and I think this is really true that it's kind of one of the great characteristics of literary mobilities. But I think it should also be added that close reading is just a skill that it's not unique to those studying literature. Um, you know, when I think about transport history or mobility studies, you know, some of the great close readings have come from historians, geographers, um, cultural theorists, you know, I'm thinking of just, you know, think of people like uh, Mark Brosso, Chivalbush, uh, Michel de Sert, Tim Edenser, Bernard Seeger, Paul Rilio, you know, who annoyingly have got no ostensible background in literary studies, but they're still capable of bringing brilliant close readings to bear on texts. This also makes me wonder that is the uniqueness of literary geographies less about close reading than about the fact that the texts are particularly set up and arranged in a way that repays close reading. Um, for instance, you can take a car journey to a Paris airport as Marc Auger does at the beginning of his, on sort of in his book, Non Places, and kind of uh, force a close reading onto it. Um, but it's a really willed and deliberate act. But I would argue that when you're reading or encountering a car journey in Evelyn War, or in the poetry of Ginsberg, or in the novels of Virginia Woolf, you cannot be unaware that it requires reading. That hopefully, you know, reading in the widest sense of the word. Um, and I think that this is perhaps because for all the apparent contingency of encountering a sentence, and encountering mobility or ideas of mobility within a sentence, you're also aware that the destination is already planned and set in stone. Um, and this brings me to sort of my final point, which I think is also kind of a summation of all I've hopefully been suggesting, I hope coherently. Um, and that is that um, artistic representations do not just highlight the embodied nature of mobility, but they also enmesh this with a wider socio-historical narrative. Um, you know, one of the recent debates um, in mobility studies and in terms of, in, you know, sort of, yeah, I think it mostly in mobility studies is really involved whether you should foreground the impact of systems or to highlight the embodied nature of mobility. Um, you know, again, arguments about whether or not to use uh, Latour's actor network theory or the recent rise in interest in non-representational theory creates this tension between kind of the will of systems and the experience of the individual. Um, these are obviously not mutually exclusive, but what I want to suggest is that artistic representations create their own type of dialectic between the systemic and the subjective. Um, I mean, for a start, 
artistic representations are traditionally fundamentally about the human self. You know, most novels have a central protagonist. Um, you know, the human is often placed right at the heart of literary um, narrative. Um, and yet also, these narratives always connect the individual with something wider. Um, for the, some of the examples that I've given, Swift's pedestrian also stands in for most male proto-flaneurs of the early 18th century, or Dickens' description of train journeys also speaks to kind of the disruption of the coming of the railways, you know, the sense of, um, you know, the 1860s and this sense of this tearing apart and this fissuring of the social fabric. Um, George Lukash, in his work on the historical novel and elsewhere, formulates the idea that great novels are realist in the sense that they go beyond an individualist focus to show all levels of human life. Um, and of course, all levels of human life also include history, um, because we all live in history too. Um, Lukash also suggests that novels create typical characters not in the sense of average or schematic or even eccentric representations, but because their innermost being is determined by objective forces at work in society. The determining factors of a particular historical phase are found in them in concentrated form. Um, in this formulation, artistic representations um, foreground a type of contact zone where the individual and the socio-historical cultural connect. Um, I must be honest that I'm not particularly comfortable with thinking of great art and literature as a privileged space or a privileged uh, representation. But I do think that there is something in what Lukas says. Um, and I perhaps think that there might be another way of considering it or of making this connection. Um, and to do that, I just wanted to talk about a couple of famous or one very famous and perhaps one not quite so famous film, which involves key scenes of transport. Um, and that's, it happened one night and bend it like Beckham. Um, and it happened one night is kind of, involves kind of a veritable cornucopia of 1930s mobility. You know, you go from the luxury yacht, you go from the Greyhound bus, you go from hitchhiking, you go from uh, car races, car journeys, you go from, um, police escorts, and at the end, you, you kind of, a gyroplane even somehow manages to fit into the scenario. Um, so again, this sort of fits in with this classic idea of multiple modes of transport, multiple chronotopes, different forms of grammar, different forms of journey. Um, but also, again, I think that all of these elements, all of the kind of socio-historic cultural significance of these mobilities are also enmeshed with another set of narratives. You know, they speak to screwball comedy, they speak to male-female relations, they speak to the road movie, um, the mythology of the American heartland, um, the, rom the romance genre. Um, that also, I think very much in It Happened One Night, they also kind of speak to this idea of geography and mobility in America and its resistance to elitism. Um, one might wonder kind of what went wrong. Um, and again, as another example, this is Gurinder Chanda's um, Bend It Like Beckham. The film really interestingly starts in the, an attic room in a really small enclosed space. Um, it then kind of ends in an airport at Heathrow. Um, and also in the middle section, you continue, continually in the film get scenes of aeroplanes flying through the sky. Um, the film is set in Hounslow, so that kind of may explain that with the proximity of Heathrow, but I think it's kind of more than an accident that the aeroplane and the airport is featured so often in this um, film. You know, it's almost as if um, the kind of the ideas of modernity that you associate with the aeroplane, the ideas of diaspora, the ideas of cultural mixing, the ideas of uh, an extended mobility throughout um, the world. This is also really tied into the kind of the narrative of Bend It Like Beckham uh, with its own personal story about one woman or perhaps two women trying to transform or bend cultural norms. Um, okay, I mean, just to sum up and 
perhaps just to sort of restate kind of the argument from the beginning. When I started studying and researching and looking at the coaching network and trying to think about how to look towards the book that I was writing or the study that I was doing um, and looking at the coaching network and the development of roads, my first impulse and the first thing that I kind of did, and I think of it now as rather strange, is that I kept trying to separate out that which is road from a novel and that which is coach and kind of I find that found that that really didn't get me very far um, and in fact it was only really when I started to join and connect these types of transports with the narratives that they were in that I started to actually find and see what that kind of mode of transport started to mean these seem to be the kind of really interesting parts of the study um, and so I kind of began by sort of sort of suggesting that the way that I do literary mobility felt like a kind of an add-on to the rather serious research of others. Um, what I kind of like to suggest finally perhaps is that literary mobility does provide something very different and very valid. Um, I think this placing of mobility alongside utterly different literary or filmic narratives allows both an enmeshing between the individual, the individual and the collective, the systemic and the subjective, but also that artistic representations constantly and inevitably reframe and reinvent um, the significance and the signification of transport. Um, and kind of the, my final point here, I guess, is that in a way, this idea of reframing and reinventing significant, this, you know, the signification of transport is perhaps, I think, what we're, we are all working towards. Okay, and thank you very much for, for listening.